I bet you lie awake at night wondering which Italian Jaws clone is the funniest. Once and for all, Billy, is the fish or me? What Thai crocodile wizards might have to offer. And whether the other shark attack movies are any good. The ones that don't do this. This isn't a documentary about Jaws, how it saved the shark film from over-emoting fishermen. Ah, they took my hand and give me this. And made redundant the previous stars of natural horror. The giant ape, the prehistoric puppet, and the oversized allegory for arrogant man science. Guinea pig, big as a police dog. It's a look at a few of the many imitations Jaws inspired, whether their beasts be fish, mammal, or lawnmower. <laughs> I watched too many researching a book on blockbuster copy culture, but here I'm only going to cover some of the very best, funniest, and weirdest. For context, the movies are rated out of 10 for how derivative of Jaws they are, how objectively good they are, and how entertainingly bad. You think about everything. If we start at the beginning, straight out of the gate was Buckle Yow, a shoddy Brazilian parody that, as we can see from the poster, isn't funny. The beast is a giant cod upset that humans keep eating its relatives, so it decides to turn as many as it can into plastic skeletons. The only bit worth knowing about is the finale, in which the townspeople forget to kill the fish before serving it up in a banquet. Which leads to this. Much better than Buckle Yow, and definitely funnier, is Grizzly which plays out just like Jaws, only dumb and with a bear. Christopher George is the Brody, Richard Jekyll the Hooper, and it falls to Joe Dorsey to ignore them both as the mayor. There's no need to close the park. $40 million worth of audience didn't seem to care how familiar it was, and made Grizzly the most lucrative Jaws clone of the era prompting many of the underpaid crew to fire winning court cases at exec producer and distributor Edward Montoro. A grisly sequel almost followed the first film in 1983, but the project was abandoned near completion when producer Joseph Ford Proctor revealed he hadn't raised the finance he claimed and disappeared. An unwatchable work print was leaked online. It's very bad. But in 2019, completion funds were obtained, perhaps thanks to pre-famed Charlie Sheen, Laura Dern and George Clooney being among the cast. And the film finally began limited screening as Grizzly 2 Revenge in early 2020. Before work even began on a Grizzly sequel, the original film spawned a couple of its own rip-offs. Bad. It was as big as a house. Claws is so underhanded that in some European markets it was called Grizzly, while in Canada it apparently went by Grizzly 2. Ironically, it feels as incomplete as the bootleg work print of the official sequel. Whoa, what's the trouble? Bear, man. B-E-A-R. I didn't believe them signs know how. Snow Beast has much in common with Grizzly, except you never see the Beast, which is a Bigfoot, the most popular mythical shark stand-in in a subgenre that rarely deals with fictional creatures. It's fine if you like TV melodrama. Maybe I'll recognize her when I see her face. She doesn't have one. There's also the capture of Bigfoot, in which a perpetually angry mayor... You must have been on the sauce again! Now where the hell is it?! ...hires local thugs to catch a man in a cosy-looking onesie. Even less effort went into how the thing sounds than the way it looks. The first shark film to bear the influence of Jaws was the largely and rightly forgotten TV movie Shark Kill. It borrows all the characters, makes them horribly boring and then blows up a pressurised container in the shark's mouth.
The Jaws of Death tried to provide some balance by painting sharks as the victims. It's an evangelical anti-Jaws outburst, allegedly written before Benchley's novel, and sees Richard Jekyll play almost exactly the same character he does in Grizzly, which was released a few weeks earlier. Here he's a shark guru who uses telepathic powers and violence to protect the animals from confused fishermen. After bears, the mammal most often vilified in early Jaws clones is the canine. Dogs goes heavy on the science with two hoopers, a smarmy one and a renegade one. Have you got something I can drink? Who strut about a college campus trying to make Labradors look scary, while the Dean refuses to make a fuss. I'm only asking you to warn people, to ask them to keep their dogs at home at night. Give me proof. Amusingly, George Weiner plays a Lothario. It seems our simple handshake has caused an unmanageable surge of electricity. And the movie's 4th of July on the beach is a dog show at a kindergarten. You let the kids have a dog show? Are you crazy? Maybe more interesting to genre fans is The Pack. Writer-director Robert Klaus, who made Enter the Dragon and just as important Jim Cutter, Jim Cutter, had some good ideas, like introducing characters through their dogs and commenting on animal welfare and environmental pollution by conflating the two issues. Both movies have the same problem, though. Dogs might be more of a potential threat than, say, rabbits, but at the end of the day, they're just dogs. Move it! At least they're scarier than ants. This likeable TV movie features an eclectic cast including Barry Son of Dick Van Dyke, Robert Foxworth, Linda Day George, Bernie Casey, Brian Dennehy, and Hollywood legend Myrna Loy in one of her final roles. Will you bring me five more martinis? But it lumbers them with a feeble adversary. It's ants. I don't know how, I don't know why, but that's what it is. Ants are ants, not these ants. It's the most Jaws-like of the era's many killer insect movies. But while bees can engulf their victims in a cloud of flying death, ants can't really do anything. The ants are coming into the hall! Escape requires no more than functioning legs, preferably with shoes on the ends, because in order to kill, the ants must cover an unconscious or stupid victim almost entirely and bite them hundreds of times. Water, a broom or mild vigilance will save you from the dance of doom. Not only did Brazil beat Italy onto the Jaws bandwagon with Buckle Yell, but so did Thailand. At least that's what an English language distributor, who renamed local quickie Rumbling the Elephant as Elephant Jaws, wanted Europeans to think. It's nothing like Spielberg's movie. But the production company behind it weren't above stealing from another proto-blockbuster. A couple of years later, Sompot Sands, the filmmaker behind Thai versions of Ultraman, Kamen Rider and Jumborg Ace, delivered a full-blooded Thai Jaws rip-off in The Tedious Crocodile. The second half in particular works like Jaws, with Brody, Quint and Hooper out at sea hunting the beast until it blows up. Nearly within the frame. In 1980, Sands retrieved his mechanical monster from storage and made another killer croc movie, claiming the absence of sharks in Southeast Asia meant he had to rely on reptiles during the post-Jaws killer animal frenzy. But sharks do live in Thai coastal waters, while crocodiles don't. In terms of weirdness, that's the tip of the iceberg. Never touch the bird. The Deep was among the first mainstream films to try and capitalize on the public's newfound interest in sharks. Based on Jaws author Peter Benchley's follow-up novel, it's heavy on the crime and melodrama that was cut from Spielberg's film. There are many familiar elements, including Robert Shaw, but it's a moody update of the treasure hunter shark movies rather than a Jaws clone, 
and despite a top-draw cast, it's too cold and humorless to be much fun. The same goes for Orca, which is completely earnest, despite being as silly as any low-budget foreign-language oddity. It's an inversion of Jaws in which the humans are the monsters and the vengeful whale hatches a plan to blow up their fuel store. Apparently whales have a working knowledge of impact resistance, combustion, pyrology and industrial safety features. While Hollywood's mainstream was failing to engineer a viable Jaws clone, its underbelly kept cranking out trash. Four disposable disasters worth seeing, maybe. A Barracuda, Blood Beach, Humanoids from the Deep, and Up from the Depths. Barracuda was the first example of jaw exploitation to use man-made pollution as a plot device, and features a dodgy medical research facility spewing toxins that generate hungry fish and angry humans. In Blood Beach, John Saxon faces off against a monster we see less of than the boom mic, and offers none too subtle tributes. It's when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, you can't get to it. In Humanoids from the Deep, everyone over 25 wears a body warmer and everyone under 25 swimwear. I mention that because there's nothing else to talk about, apart from the thing's worryingly large fan base. The undisputed winner of this good-bad grudge match is up from the depths. Directed by Tarantino favourite Charles B. Griffith, the writer who penned The Little Shop of Horrors, Bucket of Blood and Death Race 2000 for Roger Corman, the movie's mixture of parody and sincerity belies a long-running argument between Griffith and Corman, with the legendary producer feeling his author should take the work more seriously. Jimmy! Typically, Corman wanted a thrilling imitation of the chaotic hunt scene from Jaws, but Griffith gave him an army of idiots wielding spears, crossbows, kitchenware and a samurai sword. Tropes are gleefully subverted, and the calm, rational guy who normally survives to save the day doesn't. His insides are all busted. He's dead. It's fine. There are plenty of better characters. Well, you start pissing him alone, and I got a business proposition for you. Earl, if you don't get out of here, I'll have you killed. Obviously not all killer animal or shark movies count as jaw exploitation, so we should probably define what it is, and where Jaws came from. The original book and film were influenced by two works in particular, Henrik Ibsen's play An Enemy of the People, which we can thank for the tension between keeping holidaymakers safe and beaches open, and Herman Melville's novel Moby Dick, which gave us Quint in the last third of the story. I'm not sure how faithful this version is. In terms of movies, Peter Benchley, Steven Spielberg and Carl Gottlieb, the writer who adapted and developed Benchley's screenplay, have cited The Thing from Another World, It Came from Outer Space, the US version of the original Godzilla, The Creature from the Black Lagoon and King Kong. I'd add disaster movies, The Proto Slasher and Alfred Hitchcock among others. The least we can do is to provide the proper atmosphere. The most important elements they contributed to are the film's clean, relentless structure and characters. The everyman whose warnings are ignored, the official who ignores them, the crusty expert with a beef, the awkward expert with a degree, and the beast, just an animal doing its thing. The shark in Jaws has no unnatural agenda and no personality beyond what we project onto it. The setting is also key. Martha's Vineyard stood in for Amity, but it can be anywhere contained and on the edge of the animal's domain. These are just core ingredients. A full-fat clone might look like this. Main title over the animal's POV. Naked woman entices man and gets eaten for being promiscuous. We meet Brody, an amiable family man and local law enforcer. Human remains are found on the beach. Brody wants the beach shut, but the mayor won't cancel the 4th of July. <laughs> Brody sees something and raises the alarm. Everyone panics. A child is killed. And a dog. The mayor continues to downplay the threat in a town meeting. Quint. Brody learns about his adversary. Hooper arrives. The Hooper's often a love interest. Yeah, I'm Cat Stone. Idiots go off in chase of the bounty on the beast. Hooper examines the latest victim. The idiots catch the wrong beast, but nobody wants to believe it, so they see what's inside. Ben Gardner's corpse gives us a scare. Fourth of July. Lots of security. False alarm. The shark attacks a little boat. Brody gives it to the mayor, and the mayor gives Quint and Co. the green light. Quint reveals his history in a monologue. Hooper goes in a cage. Quint dies. Beast dies. Make a love, who? Hooray! 
Some of those tropes and characters may sound generic, but the way they're arranged in Jaws' exploitation is quite specific. Many animal horror movies have been branded Jaws rip-offs just for surfing a wave of thematic popularity, and more belong to the Nature Strikes Back subgenre, which usually traps an ensemble cast in the domain of unnatural animals often motivated by vengeance. If we're lucky, Leslie Nielsen might fight a bear. Some films borrow just a little Jaws. In The White Buffalo, Charles Bronson's Wild Bill Hickok goes back west to face his past and find the subject of his nightmares. A great white beast. It rings many bells, but isn't a rip-off. And nor is The Bermuda Depths, which, like The White Buffalo, features ghosts, dreams and weirdness in a genre-mashing misery about a giant turtle. Oh, come on, not bad. Despite Carl Weathers, it's awful unlike Legend of Dinosaurs and Monster Birds. When Japanese film studio Toei cottoned onto the trend for killer animal movies, they quite rightly combined it with the domestic kaiju formula. The plot sees an enormous pterodactyl egg hatch on Mount Fuji, just as a plesiosaur wakes up in a nearby lake. Although often described as a Jaws clone, it only takes the odd element, like the scene of beach panic caused by pranking kids. The same goes for Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, which only spoofs the odd moment. In addition to trash, parodies and oddities, some genuinely great Jaws clones appeared in the late 70s. Often overlooked is the car, about an apparently demonic and driverless custom Lincoln which rolls into a small desert town to feed on the locals. It features all the tropes from the small community to the public event that must go ahead, and the fact the antagonist is a machine rather than a living creature has no bearing. This is Wade. We can't let him through no matter what. James Brolin gives good Brody as the father and sheriff who must stop the thing. But as with Jaws, the real star is the monster. The film was eviscerated by critics on release. Ruth Batchelor of the Los Angeles Free Press writing, It's hard to believe Elliot Silverstein directed Cat Blue or A Man Called Horse because in this picture he didn't even direct traffic. OK. Alligator is another 70s B-movie deserving of more attention. Robert Forster is outstanding as a disillusioned detective investigating apparent murders in Chicago's sewers. Your alligator is a very romantic creature. And Henry Silver's hilarious as the arrogant big game hunter called in to kill what turns out to be a gator. <coughs> the beast grew massive eating dogs subjected to bad science. But the movie doesn't spend much time moralising thanks to it already juggling mystery, satire, horror, suspense, schlock, and even character detail. Look, I'm fighting male parent baldness. I'm a little sensitive on the subject. I hope you don't mention it again. A sequel that's really more of a reboot arrived 11 years later, and it's good. Or at least good bad. I've always been amused by this cop casually fishing body parts from a lake in front of a child. Now that it ate the bomb, can that thing go off any time? Despite the appeal being largely ironic, it has a strong cast that includes Richard Lynch as an alligator hunter. We'd have been he hard here to Cuba where a guy out with brung an army. <coughs> Steven Spielberg's favourite Jaws clone is Piranha, although I doubt he's seen Ghost Shark. Allegedly, Universal wanted to take legal action to prevent its release, presumably before realising director Joe Dante and writer John Sayles altered and added a fair amount to the formula. We still get lots of Jaws, particularly the guy who ignores the warnings and keeps the beaches open. But the main characters don't really fit the archetypes. There's a different backstory, an even simpler structure, and the whole movie keeps its tongue in its cheek. People eat fish, Grogan. Fish don't eat people. The impeccable screenplay is driven by Bradford Dillman's drunken hermit Paul Grogan attempting to rescue his daughter from a summer camp about to be invaded by military-grade piranha. 
In addition to Dick Miller, they're lucky enough to be fed Kevin McCarthy, Barbara Steele and Paul Bartell. It's the perfect mix of humour and horror. What about the goddamn piranhas? They're eating the guests, sir. The follow-up's a winner too, and not only because the fish can fly now. James Cameron was supposed to direct the movie, but producer Ovidio Asoatis replaced him on set. Cameron's writing is evident in protagonist Anna Kimbrough, though. She's one of the best conceived and most believable Brodies of exploitation. A capable woman who steps up and saves the day almost by herself. I gotta get the camera and get back down there before it gets dark. It's even sillier than the first film. For some reason, the original Piranha was remade for television in 1995. Nothing interesting is added to the mix, unless you count a young Myla Kunis or this Spielberg impersonator. Uh, everybody just call me Terry. And we just get a watered down retread with blander actors. Hey, you cool your jets, lady. I didn't axe murder your young couple. I can't help you. I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them or anyone else for that matter. See, that's why I live up here in the wilds of nature. Sorry, I can't help. It's like watching a cover band rehearse. My daughter's down there! The piranha are coming! You've got to believe me! Incredibly, it's still better than the name-only 2010 remake, which, like most recent shark movies, replaces the Jaws template with bad CGI, lazy misogyny, and this kind of acting. This particular piranha vanished! off the face of the earth more than two million years ago. Right at the camera. In an even more depressing cameo, Richard Dreyfus turns up dressed like Hooper to embarrass himself. Show me the way to go home. The follow-up, Piranha Double D, is, well. Tell me you did not fire our old lifeguards and replace them with strippers. Water certified strippers. Given its propensity for plagiary, it's surprising the Italian exploitation industry didn't get a Jaws knockoff into theatres until 1977. Tentacles was a co-production with AIP and gives us a sleepwalking John Huston, strung out Shelley Winters, and completely immobile Henry Fonda in a load of rubbish about a giant octopus. It sets a challenging tone by opening on baby death, and then blends Jaws into movies like It Came From Beneath the Sea. On the land it looks kind of great, and on the water it's funny. Which gives it two points on the great alligator. In this tale of an angry gator god eating boatloads of extras, Sergio Martino throws native legend, disaster movies, and Barbara Bark at us. But it's no use. And nor is Martino's Screamers, one of many late 70s foreign B-movies often wrongly believed to be Jaws rip-offs. Some others include Cyclone, Killer Fish, Tintorera Killer Shark, and The Shark Hunter, in which Franco Nero needs no more than a parasail and a knife to validate the movie's title. <music> Director Enzo Castellari may have ignored Jaws in The Shark Hunter, but he made up for it a couple of years later in The Last Shark. This is the movie which effectively closed out the first era of Jawsploitation and probably took things a little too far, even if we ignore some of the alternative titles. Contrary to legend, the notorious carbon copy was initially released in US theatres, where it performed well until legal intervention from Universal saw it effectively banned for being so derivative. It may have a more limited range of attack techniques, but even the mechanical shark appears to be based on Bruce. Belated US home video releases mean that today there are many ways to see The Last Shark, but still no good reasons. Oh, things I do for show business. Piranha 2 and The Last Shark represent the end of the first phase of exploitation. These kind of movies came thick and fast in the late 70s, but when The Last Shark attracted the attention of the grown-ups at Universal, the party seemed to be over, and for a couple of years exploitation lay dead in the water with a few left-field foreign language exceptions. Keith! Oh, 
The Lift is a Dutch horror about an elevator with a taste for blood. Needless to say, it doesn't fully conform to the exploitation MO. But it's surprising how much it does manage to borrow. In a few months, we'll have that merge with the Americans wrapped up. That's going to mean more work for everyone. This is no time to bring up problems. Problems? The DIY effects and weird dub make it undeniably funny. Mommy, when do I get breasts? When you learn not to talk at the table while we're eating. Chul, better known as Turkish Jaws, stars the incredible Chunit Arkan as Kamal, an everyman abandoned in shark-infested waters by the bad guy. It doesn't really fit the epithet, despite featuring lumps of John Williams' score. But the shark's great, and the direction from prolific copy culture pioneer Chetin and Anch is as dynamic as always. The best of these international obscurities is Taiwanese kung fu crossover Renshe Da Zhang, which goes by Calamity of Snakes in the West, and is part comedy gold, part genuinely disturbing reptilian snuff film. No other killer animal movie hates its animals so much. He kills some snakes every day. Now he's living as happy as anyone else. His business is good too. Come on, have some snake soup. <laughs> Thousands of snakes are chopped, skinned, bulldozed and butchered on camera and in graphic detail. And when they're not being killed, people are talking about killing them. This cobra is going to get killed, sliced, and you're going to enjoy it very much because it's going to make you very, very healthy. It'll make you feel good when I slice it open and give you the good juice. We surround it, we cut it up, we're going to go inside and get the bladder. The bladder that has the juice that'll make you feel healthier than you ever did. Now watch. Here we go. We're going to get right into it. And you'll never, never see anything like this again. Yes, the bladder. There it is. And the good juice. Look, it was a healthy snake. Watch the heartbeat. Jawsploitation's second wind came in the summer of 1984, and among the early interesting movies was Razorback. Given that every square inch of Australia is home to something that wants to kill us, it's no surprise the country eventually embraced the genre. But despite being sold as Jaws on trotters, the story of a killer boar terrorising an outback community is more than a clone. Director Russell McCahey makes good use of incredible cinematography from road warrior DOP Dean Semler, creating a potent atmosphere with a heightened sense of place, which is only emphasised by some colourful characters. Something about blasting the shit out of a Razorback that brightens up my whole day. Contrasting with Razorback's severe tone is the absurdity of Shark's Paradise, one of the hidden gems of jawsploitation. <laughs> Unfortunately, this TV movie about a madman luring sharks into the coastal waters of Surfer's Paradise has gone unreleased on home format since its 1987 video debut. The Miami Vice meets Neighbours aesthetic is unique, and the tone's all over the place. Dr. Baxter, has anyone had access to your research? Killer Crocodile Hokum Dark Age is the most Jaws-like of this Antipodean triptyque. The premise involves a dispute between an Aboriginal community and the residents of a neighbouring tourist town over how to handle the beast, which Aborigines believe harbours the souls of the dead. It's an interesting concept, well executed, on the whole, but for many the main takeaway will be the presence of Home and Away's Alf Stewart. Who'd want to come here for a holiday when there's a chance of being eaten by crocodiles? Shortly after the release of Razorback, the Italian exploitation industry returned to Jawsploitation with Devilfish, also known in English as Red Ocean, Devouring Waves, Jaws Attack 2, Shark and Monster Shark, despite it not being a shark. Sergio Martino, the director of The Great Alligator, co-wrote the script, which was helmed by Lamberto Bava, and anyone familiar with either filmmaker should know what to expect. It stars the great Michael Sopkeefe as an electronics wizard roped into helping with the hunt for a beast leaving mutilated victims on Florida's beaches. Unusually, it turns out that a naughty scientist is to blame for everything, and his inevitable death might be the best bit of the movie. You won't ever 
be able to destroy my creature. If you're wondering what Jaws Attack 2, one of Devilfish's alternative titles, was meant to be a sequel to, it's this enjoyable Trait Williams movie, which was released as Jaws Attack and Night of the Shark four years after Devilfish. Staying in Italy, Killer Crocodile and its sequel are more derivative but less entertaining, despite all the silly crocodile stuff. Shot back to back in the Dominican Republic, both movies at least look good, but a highlights reel is all you need. Deep Blood is no better and far more forgettable. In fact, all you're likely to remember are teenagers emoting at footage from The Last Shark. A fate which could have befallen Cruel Jaws, the jewel in the Italian Jawsploitation crown, if it wasn't so amusingly bad. This Bruno Mattei TV movie, infamously known as Jaws 5 in many territories, was made using the Troll 2 method, which sees Italian producers bowl into a US town and give starring roles to whoever turns up to see what's happening. It's not like fishing for sardines. Like Deep Blood, it's full of the young, and the role of the shark seems to be to add to their troubles. But unlike Deep Blood, these young are funny. What do you want? The person in charge of pussy. I have to, you know, check your credit. <laughs> dick brain, dick brain, dick brain. <laughs> yeah, that's how I get through it too. Matei steals not only scenes from Jaws, but whole lines of dialogue. And all they really know how to do is, is swim, eat, and make baby sharks. And stuff that isn't in the movie like this prank lifted shot for shot from Jaws 3. Action Bay Police! Don't you dirty little devils know you're polluting the ocean doing that? And the gangster subplot from Benchley's original novel. For your own good. Sadly, it isn't true that the author was credited for his unknowing contribution. But it is true it steals footage from Jaws, although I'm not brave enough to show it. And much more comes from Deep Blood and The Last Shark anyway. including the climactic shark explosion, which appears in all three movies. The Jaws score is absent for once, although John Williams is there in spirit every time the Star Wars theme nearly happens. At least it's a movie with a message. Sharks are really bad. This whole town is going crazy. Another movie with a message is Lobsteroids, which continually emphasises the importance of not watching Lobsteroids. Miss Queen, there's no other way around it. You've got to stop the rock off. You don't understand, Miss Queen. Thousands of lives could be at stake here. It's an amateur production about a town plagued by a killer lobster during the build-up to a music... Oh, I don't care. Fortunately, there are Jaws parodies that get it right. Blades takes place in a country club gearing up for the big annual golf tournament, but the setting's no handicap mm -hmm. thanks to the inventiveness with which writer-director Thomas Rondinea tackles important Jaws scenes like the mass hunt which leads to the wrong beast being caught, they even do the autopsy, it's brilliant. And the revealing Quint monologue interrupted by an attack. And one day, management brought in new machines. Japanese machines. Sure, they had a wider cutting radius, but Tad, he didn't care. It works because everything's played straight, no matter how silly. Whether it counts as parody is debatable, but the Spielberg-produced arachnophobia is full of jaws. Jeff Daniels and director Frank Marshall watched the film repeatedly for inspiration, taking Brody's fear of the water and exaggerating it into the titular phobia. It's a really effective movie, tense and funny. He came across one of the offending spiders a couple hours ago. 
Might you have brought it with you? Actually, it's probably still in the bottom of my shoe. While we're on the subject of Spielberg, let's have a look at the Jaws sequels he wanted nothing to do with. Jaws 2 is a rerun of the first movie with a lot more Brody. I have had some experience with sharks. What have you? And it's as redundant as Jaws 3D is ridiculous. Set around an underwater aquarium, it's focused on the now adult Brody children, and all it has going for it is Simon McCorkingdale. This film is a bloody retirement annuity. And the fact it isn't Jaws the Revenge. While Steven Spielberg avoided returning to the sea, Peter Benchley never left. Creature, which warns of the dangers of hybrid shark men, is a TV miniseries adapted from his novel of the same name, but it's boring as hell. If you want Shark Man schlock, try, well, Shark Man. Now he's more shark than human. If you really want to see a Jaws-like 90s miniseries written by Peter Benchley, then try The Beast, I guess. It's exactly the same, only with a squid. As far as tomorrow's Founders Day celebration is concerned, we had considered cancelling it, but we decided not to. Still isn't very interesting, though, and the 90s gave as much that is. Our Tank, also known as Bollywood Jaws, stars Hindi icon Dharmendra in a story of tragic love, bad men and worse sharks. It's pretty much what you'd expect, which means stuff like this happens. It won't be for everyone, but the finale in which our hero kills the fish and takes out the villain with a harpoon is incredible. As Hollywood and the wider world began to lose interest in Jaws as a movie blueprint, one man kept the flame burning. Around the turn of the millennium, Canon Films refugee Avi Lerner released the first in what would become a tidal wave of low-budget killer animal movies. Crocodile was directed by Toby Hooper and draws on Jaws only occasionally in what's a pretty generic movie. What a story you got there. One aspect it updates is the fate of the ubiquitous pet dog. which, contrary to the quarter-century-old rules of jaws ploitation, lives. Nowadays, tiny dogs always survive in these kind of movies. Back in the day, they were fish food. The sequel ditches jaws altogether in favour of doing its own thing, which... yeah. Octopus was released around the same time as Crocodile and somehow squeezes in the Cuban Missile Crisis, marine biology, Russian smugglers, an embassy bombing, nuclear litter, a CIA operative, a US Navy submarine, an international terrorist, Sean Connery, and for some reason a cruise ship hijacking. What is this? It's your teeth. <gasps> All that stuff leaves little room for the giant octopus and even less for Jaws. The sequel, though, answers the question of what Jaws would look like if it happened in New York. And was stupid. Detective Nick Hartfield is a tightly wound police diver who cottons onto the presence of a giant octopus in the Hudson River. Apparently... That storm we had in June brought a lot of water south from up near Nova Scotia, and it's possible that this creature was swept down with it and it's trapped or nesting out in the Hudson. I'm not sure giant octopi are native to Canadian waters. The urban setting is an improvement on the submarine of the first movie, and like Alligator 2, the mutation demonstrates that cities are an underused commodity in Jaws' ploitation. The acting's better too, which makes it feel more like a proper film. Although not that proper. At its worst, the octopus looks like something that should be hassling 1970s Doug McClure. And for some reason, six pieces of what I'm going to assume is a mix of stock and stolen footage were needed to blow it up. I didn't edit that. There really are one, two, three four, five, six different explosions. And look at this. The final blast happens in the background of this mid-shot of our heroes, but they vanish in the middle of the shot. Again, I haven't edited it, only slowed it down. At full speed it's easy to miss, the brain sees a cut. Presumably it's a post-production cock-up, but it's bizarre.
Bizarre is kind of a feature of these movies. So let's pause briefly on Shark Zone to acknowledge how strange it is to dub characters who are underwater with regulators in their mouths. Jimbo, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, Dad. Yeah, we're good. Good to go. Doesn't work like that. Jesus, you have to close the beach. What? This thing's funny. Shark Attack may be the only movie franchise in history best known for its third entry, but the others are almost as good. Calm down, mate. The first sees Casper Van Dien's marine biologist investigating the disappearance of a friend, only to run into bioengineered sharks, Ernie Hudson, and a convoluted something or other. The acting and dialogue are memorable. So you're the one who stole my thumpers. I gave them to him. And he used them to kill the tourist business. Yes, literally. Simple economics. The more sharks, the less people. First your crazy sharks ate all the fish and killed the fishing. Now that was beautiful. But when Hacker told me about your little thumpers, well, that was simply divine. The first sequel features a different set of characters bumbling about a Cape Town aquarium. But this time, among their number is somebody engaging. You're kidding, right? TV actor Thorsten K is Brody Hooper hybrid Dr. Nick Harris. I might even let you be on my show. Now, excuse me, I've got to go sign some autographs. And he knows exactly how to play material like this. Are you talking to you or me? It features much more Jaws than the first movie, and they even attempt the legendary Dolly Zoom. You know, sharks are evil. They need to be destroyed. Get a crocodile dundee out of my face. But the magnum opus of the series, and Avi Lerner's great gift to mankind, is Shark Attack 3 Megalodon. <laughs> the last important good bad shark movie, and perhaps the most revered example of such a thing ever made. John Barrowman stars as Harbour Patrolman Ben Carpenter, and this is what he has to deal with. Some of Senor Tolly's people said that. You were diving near the cable yesterday. Yeah, I was. But I wasn't messing with it, if that's what you're getting at. Uh, they said that um, it's in something bit through the protective covering and damaged some of the fiber optics. There's a bit of everything, including actors trying Serious. to keep a straight face. We found a guy's leg near a beach where he was playing frisbee with his dog. Oh my god. Weird supporting characters. You've been running around nonstop all day. Why don't you take a break? Inexplicable plot devices, like having everyone jump into the water to escape the shark that's in the water and the best use of stock footage you'll ever see. If you wonder what that shot looks like printed day for night, Deep Blood has the answer. And then there's this. You know, I'm really wired. What do you say I take you home and eat your pussy? Because I live in a country in which John Barrowman became a star, I saw him explain this on a chat show. It was a joke to make her laugh. They left it in the frickin' movie. <laughs> that I could let my nieces and nephew watch and then all of a sudden Uncle John's going, what do you say? I take your own <laughs> During the early years of the new millennium, these throwbacks represented Jules Ploitation's last thrash on the B-movie deck. At the same time, lurking beneath, a motley collection of trash offered competing visions for the future of the low-budget shark film. Blood Surf was fairly prophetic with its futility and crass references. Oh, man, this is going to be better than... What was the name of that shark flick? Jaws. Ka -ching. Although Dark Waters correctly predicted a major role for lifeless CGI. Shark Hunter brought nothing to the table. It's a goddamn train with teeth. While Red Water thought this kind of thing might be the answer. Anybody else want to play? I got more game. Think I'm playing with you? And and your ass off. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. It could all have been so different. A few years earlier, advances in technology looked set to trigger a new era of killer animal movies, with money, real actors and self-awareness deployed in the likes of Anaconda and Deep Blue Sea. Despite working in similar fields, the makers of these films rejected Jules' exploitation, Mostly. Unfortunately, this hopped-up schlock never really took off but occasional echoes bounce around the multiplex. 
As the noughties wore on, cinemas became home to humorless, mid-budget, high-concept thrillers. While back at the cheap and dumb end of the market, shark exploitation was of course consumed by the irresistible force of ironic CGI overkill. Today, even otherwise unironic low-budget shark movies can't help themselves. Well, be fun. <laughs> and the fashion is for clumsy references rather than thievery, which has rendered Jaws more of a punchline than a game plan. We're gonna need a bigger chopper. Cruel Jaws has already done that one. We need a bigger helicopter! This is where I get off the boat. These things have appeal, but they're not sincere. Unlike Cruel Jaws or Shark Attack 3, they're exactly what they're supposed to be, so there's no charm or humour in their failure. If you want big, dumb, mutant animals, watch Gamera Super Monster. It has an armoured space shark and a rocket-powered turtle water skiing on a killer squid the size of a skyscraper. There's Star Wars, superheroes, anime stock footage. One of these, whatever this is. A Japanese schoolboy playing Camp Town Lady on the electric organ. And this. What else do you want? 